This is Tokens. I'm Lee C. Camp. Aristotle insisted that each virtue has at least two affiliated vices. Take Southern politeness as an example. I actually think it's quite a fine virtue, a social embodiment of kindness. Too little, and you can imagine yourself wandering down the street in Moscow or... <laughs> <laughs> or Manhattan. Too much and you fall prey to mean-spirited conflict avoidance. This latter failing was, has been, often still is, one of my vices. And then I get reminded. Peace regularly doesn't look very peaceful. Peace looks like complex arguments that happen between people. That's Padre Gotuma, one of the north of Ireland's finest poets and a theologian. He's done years of work trying to facilitate peace in the northern of Ireland among parties hostile one to the other. Until recently, he was leader of the Cory Mila community, Ireland's oldest peace and reconciliation community. I've been in rooms with people where one person would say, I'm a member of this organization, and another person would say, well, that organization shot my father, and then deny that they shot him or called him a legitimate target. So those are terrible rooms to be in. Where I've seen... That kind of dialogue work has been where somebody can speak very truthfully and very bluntly, but with an invitation to say, we can do this better with each other. Our interview with poet Padre Gotuma, along with some of his poetry, in just a moment. Grateful today to be interviewing Mr. Padre Gotuma of the northern of Ireland, <laughs> uh, poet, theologian, and a peacemaker. Welcome, Padraig. Thanks very much, Lee. It's nice to be with you. You've been doing uh, work there in, in various forms of, of peacemaking and, and healing of communities for quite some time. Would you, would you tell us a little bit about uh, Cory Mila and the work that you've, you've done there through the years? Yeah, so Cory Mila is a reconciliation community that was set up in 1965 by a bunch of students and some older people as well. The first leader was Reverend Ray Davey, who was a Presbyterian minister. He had been a prisoner of war during the Second World War. He had been a volunteer padre with the YMCA. He was captured and imprisoned then near Dresden. And his release from that prisoner of war camp came as a result of the bombing of Dresden. And that was, of course, considered, is, of course, considered a war crime, um, that bombing, because of the civilian casualties that was predicted. But And it nonetheless went ahead. So he came back traumatized and also mm. saw an Ireland that had recently been partitioned by the British and was seeing that people's imagination about what freedom and um, peace could look like was usually an imagination that imagined that the other, whoever they were, would be annihilated. And so he saw, I suppose, the writing on the wall in terms of where Ireland was going. This is 1945. But already, I mean, partitioning a country is a terrible way to ever do anything. Yeah. Um, and partitioning a country just starts off new wars. So by 65, these things had gotten worse. So he started off this community of people, not a residential community, a community of people in their ordinary jobs, um, but who gathered around volunteer work at a residential center. There were symposiums about politics and peace and how to argue in a way where you weren't seeking to murder each other. And that mm. work's continued. About 10,000 people a yeah. year go through the programs at Coromila. Most of those people going through on site up on the very north coast of Ireland. Um, programs involving young people or people from different political points of view or religious points of view or community points of view or economic points of view. Yeah. So. I hear in a lot of, a lot of your work and, and what I've read about Coromila, you're trying to get people to listen well. Well, yeah, trying to get people to listen well. You're trying to get um, multiple versions of the same story to, to live in a room. Uh, you're trying to expose um, fractures from within communities where we'd all, sometimes in a conflict in society like this, you'd think, well, we all think the same and you all think the same. Often what you're trying to do is to expose that actually the we is made up of all kinds of plurals. And actually, we don't all agree. We think very different mm. things. Just on this particular topic, we think we all agree. And so sometimes by realizing that the we isn't nearly as simple or as singular as that, and if I can begin to imagine that I can be in close affiliate relationship with people who actually disagree very seriously on certain topics, just not this one, well, then I'll begin to imagine that the you, the they, the other, also has as much complexity within it. And so therefore, I'm not thinking all of you people think all of the same thing about this. I'm beginning to think, oh, you know, maybe on this topic, that other group 
think very similarly, but on other topics, they think very differently. And so alliances can become unexpected then. And you can perhaps to feel a little bit less loyal to the group belonging that you imagine forms the us and be begin to become more curious about the group belonging that forms the they. And then suddenly all yeah. kinds of unexpected alliances can occur within the context of a group. That's all done within you, the context of safety, of course. If there's the presence yeah. of threat in a room or an ongoing level of systemic threat, well, then such conversations are probably preemptive. You've spoken uh, at some length about agreement not being the basis of relationship. Will you, yeah. you talk a little bit about that? Well, agreement and common ground for me are, they're not a bad place to start, you know, if you're bringing a group of people together who've had, you know, a long history of serious fallouts and serious practiced misunderstandings with each other. Having a little bit of agreement or a little bit of common ground at the start might help things get going. So it's not like I think those are bad things. I just don't think, I just don't think that those are the things that will save us. Um, I think that curiosity and a capacity to not agree with each other um, is something that will really help. And to know, what do I do when I don't agree? And agree to disagree isn't enough either. That's a pretty boring end point. Um, I'm curious to think, how can I begin to examine, am I complicit? Am I part of the problem here? Were I stepping outside of the situation, would I realize, actually, I'm the enemy, <laughs> rather than thinking mm. we're mutual enemies? Is the cause of justice against me? Can I ask myself critical questions in public? Can I disagree seriously? Or can I realize actually a fruitful outcome is where I will change my mind and agree with you that actually I have been on the wrong side of this and that I have benefited mm. from something that I've denied? So those are very serious um, civic practices to happen in public. And so you, to create an environment where that can happen carefully, it looks careful and calm, but also it is filled with anger and with pain and with lament and with fury. Um, peace regularly doesn't look very peaceful. Peace looks like complex arguments that happen between people. And so uh, that, that requires very careful facilitation and very careful boundaries and very focused ways of saying we're going to stay on topic to this. And, and you're dealing, uh, certainly in the history of Cormila, you're dealing with loss of family members, loss of loved ones. Yeah, uh, well, Seriously. all kinds of losses, loss of family members, loss of loved ones, loss of safety, loss of the imagination about what the future can be. Also loss of language, loss of a sense of territory loss of um, a sense of his historical connection um, with a history that you love, loss of the name for the place that you love and the introduction of somebody else's name for the place where you are. There's all these various levels of losses and each of those can manifest itself in different ways. So often we're speaking about different kinds of losses in groups of people with different kinds of experiences and different styles of a relationship with conflict. It's a wonder we get anything done at all. <laughs> <laughs> Um, would you talk a bit about how so often the challenge of listening seems to be burdened with the notion of that simply to listen or to seek to understand somehow underwrites complicity? Yeah. So the words you mentioned there, listening and complicity and understand, they're all words that are gathered around this question of who's right and who's wrong. And who do I believe who's right? And who do I believe who's wrong? And do I have sympathy for somebody who believed something terrible? <laughs> and if I do have sympathy for somebody who believed or did something terrible, am I on their side just because I have sympathy for them? Or can I have sympathy for somebody who did the intolerable? Mm -hmm. In a certain sense, these are questions that the human condition has been gathered around for years. When you look at the questions at the heart of the Hebrew, the Jewish book of Leviticus in the Hebrew Bible, that, that book is examining seriously the question of purity and not just purity in the idea of a god but purity in the sense of who's going to infect me with something or yeah. <laughs> who who do i think has done something so serious that they need to be removed from us for a while before they're admitted back in so these are ancient questions and they're manifesting today you know you can see them occurring on twitter very definitely um, in a small way, but that's got serious consequences. Sure. The, the questions around cancel culture are really the questions that the book of Leviticus is also holding. And the book of Leviticus has a number of um, different prescriptions as to what should happen in that. The book of Leviticus doesn't have one simple prescription or solution. 
So often in a situation like here, like in Ireland, and it's really important for me to say that I don't think the practices in Ireland transfer elsewhere. Every place needs to look at the question about how they do this there. So I'll answer from the point of view of Ireland. Um, from our perspective here to bring somebody into a room who has um, lost a member of their family who was killed by the British Army, for instance, and then bringing somebody else into the room who has lost a member of their family who were killed by the IRA. You've got these questions of legitimate forces in the room. Who believes what is a legitimate force? Some people in the room will say, yeah, here we are in Northern Ireland, which is the part of the United Kingdom. Somebody else will say, no, here we are in Ireland, which is occupied territory by the United Kingdom. And how do you have a conversation? And if a person can find the way to listen to somebody else's point of view, they might feel like they're being um, disloyal to their loved one who was murdered. Or they might feel like they're going to have their own group belonging questioned. If somebody said, I heard that you were part of that dialogue program with people from the other side, you know, for you mm. to find anything of empathy with somebody from there is to be complicit in the very wrong that you're seeking to overcome through your advocacy for justice. And so in, in any one engagement, whether that's friendship, whether that's becoming friends with your neighbor, whether that's engaging in a peace program, you've got all of these conflicting desires happening all at once. And often the imagination is, is that there's going to be a single, simple solution to what the outcome of that's going to look like. And I think the work of peace is to recognise that even in every individual, there are so many plurals. And at the same time, you can feel like, I'm glad I met that person from the other side, as well as to feel like, God, it makes me feel a little bit complicit, as well as mm. to think, I learned something, as well as to think, I had curiosity, as well as to think, that hurt, as well as to think... This is a compromise that I think is justifiable in, in the name of peace, but God, I still wish I didn't have to make that compromise. Mm. So all of those things can happen in the one person. And I think part of the imagination that says this is all for the good and it's, you know, the outcome of this is always going to be good and fully good. I think that puts people into conflict with the many intelligences and the many wisdoms that they're experiencing by being part of something. There's always going to be pain, extra pain, by taking part in peace. And the question is, is this pain tolerable for me right now? And that's not something that you can dictate to a population of people. That's something that individual people have to ask themselves and decide um, whether they will or won't. For instance, I'll give you an example. There was sometimes... Um, here we've done um, single community engagements, so working with a bunch of Catholics and a bunch of Protestants. Now, that, those are, I should say, those are shortcuts, really, to talking about working with a bunch of people who believe that Northern Ireland is a valid part of the United Kingdom and working with people who say, I don't even want to say the word Northern Ireland. I want to call it the North right. and it's a part of Ireland. Catholic and Protestant aren't here. They're, they're markers for a political understanding, really. What you think about British-Irish relations and what you think about this jurisdiction that was created 100 years ago by the British Northern Ireland, those are... Um, Catholic Protestant are shortcuts to talking about that. So we had a bunch of Catholic people and we worked with them for 12, 13 weeks, single identity groups, really to talk about how do you disagree with each other? <laughs> how do you work out with the fact that you don't all agree with each other about what a peaceful solution in the future might look like? And then at the same time, we were working with a bunch of people, a bunch of Protestant people, asking the same kind of questions so that it wasn't just an imagination of, oh, you people all think the following and you all disagree with us. It's kind of realizing, oh, we, we disagree with ourselves, like I mentioned earlier on. Hmm. And there was um, a Catholic woman in the group of Catholic people who was delighted and it was a very active part of the 12 weeks of meeting in the Catholic single identity group. And she benefited a lot from it. It was her own choice to participate. But when it came time to meet with the Protestant group, she said, um, I'm going to step out of this process now, which was entirely her own choice. And, you know, the, you could think that that therefore is a, a failure or a reluctance of her to be part of a project of peace. But that's not the case at all. She had been bereaved three times. Three close members of her family had been murdered. And she mm. knew that Protestant people would probably feel embarrassed to have somebody like her in the room. Now, whether mm. that was accurate or not, that was her um, overriding concern. 
and she thought she didn't want to get in the way of a group having so much discussion when there was somebody who had been known to have carried so much grief in public. So she stepped out of that group with all her best wishes, wrote a letter for the Protestant folks to say, I've been part of this. I wish you all the best. But for reasons of my own, and here they are, this is the reason why I'm not taking part in that. That was her own individual choice to make and it was filled with wisdom and my, my opinion was irrelevant. She had been part of a project and she demonstrated what it's like for her to take part in a civic engagement and she did that according to her own terms and made her own mind up. Mm. That was brilliant. Um, and my job yeah. is not to say what the shape of that should look like. My job was to accompany people as they made their own informed decisions like that. And I think her... Um, her participation and then her choice to not continue to participate was one that the group learned a huge amount from. I'm reminded of a story that is, is somewhat comedic and certainly not as serious in its consequences as the, as the case you just indicated. But your story about uh, one of your 11 year olds that you worked with as, as a school teacher that uh, asked about God creating Protestants, yeah. I think was how, how her line yeah. went. I was a chaplain. Um, and there was this magnificent 11-year-old who was f fantastic at football. And she, I think she'll either grow up to be a footballer or a lawyer because she had skills <laughs> in abundance for both of these. She loved to lay out a thesis when she was building something. So I knew her well. And so she said to me, Podrick, answer me this. Because I was a chaplain. They call me by my first name. Answer me this. God made us, right? And I knew she was just doing the lawyerly thing of establishing an argument. And I was like, <laughs> okay, fine. I mean, I have questions about what God means and made and all that. But th I knew that this was just the opening argument. So God made us, right? And I said, yeah, yeah. And God loves us all, right? And again, I have questions about what does that mean to conjugate a <laughs> verb for the God? Anyway, but I knew that wasn't her final point. And I said, yeah, yeah, sure. And she goes, answer me this. Why did God make Protestants? And that's a serious <laughs> question. She was born years after the peace agreements. And peace agreements are only the start of something, never the end of something. But I wanted to know why she'd ask that, because she was such a fair minded individual in her class. And she would not tolerate bullying from amongst her class, you know, but here she mm. was. And I said, tell me more about your question. And she said, they hate him and they hate us, as in us Catholics and him God. And I mean, she's 11 and I just heard that she had been educated very well by a society that had built itself on an imagination of the them and an imagination that the they hate us. <laughs> and so therefore, because of that imagination, you begin to think that they were made by some other God. So mm. and how do you begin to explain that to an 11 year old? She was very intelligent, but really all she was doing was telling me that she's part of a society that she's part of. And so um, I said, uh, I know a lot of Protestants who'd love to have you on their football team. And she was like, really? I was like, yeah, you're, <laughs> you're brilliant. And uh, part of me wanted to think the, inter the interruption of this narrative is not going to be theoretical. It's going to be human based. That, uh, and that, uh, I'm saying that within an Irish context. I'm not saying that's the same in the United States, but in an Irish context, for her, the interruption of that needed to be societal and needed to be policy based, yes. But from her point of view, I think she needed to play football with people who she really liked. And then she said, mm. because Ireland had been beaten by France in the football the week before, and it had been a handball, had been a last minute goal. And it was discovered later on that it was a handball, but only after the match had finished, you know. So after, you know, when, when I told her that there was Protestants that I knew who'd love to play football with her, she said, um, answer me another question. What about French people? What God made them? <laughs> And we were all united in our hatred of the French at that week because of the Ireland loss. So I was like, you're definitely right. Some other God made the French. Yeah. <laughs> she was magnificent. Uh, She'd be in her 20s now, presumably fighting lots of law cases or scoring yeah. goals in football. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I've learned from you and Michael McRae about this book, Moving Beyond Sectarianism and uh, their scale of sectarian danger. Uh, would, would you talk a little bit about that? I, I find that just a remarkable sort of uh, construct. So this book, Moving Beyond Sectarianism, published by Columba Press in 2001, I think, is written by an American Mennonite and a Scottish nun, um, Scottish mm. Catholic nun. Um, Cecilia Clegg is from Scotland, had lived in Ireland for many years. She is a sociologist, extraordinary, and theologian. And Joe Lichty is an American Mennonite who had lived in Ireland for years too. 
And so they did a, a sociological study, really, of um, what is sectarianism? What does it look like? What's the shape? What motivates it? What are some of the underlying layers? If a person says they hate us and they hate our God, what's underneath that? How do you begin to ask those questions? So it's a very systematic um, exploration of that absolutely particular to Ireland and I don't believe in the universal really um, but there are some things about it that apply elsewhere and one of the things they do is to talk about what is a scale from I think 1 to 11 of a non-sectarian statement to a sectarian statement and then they, they problematize that too because something that seems very non-sectarian can be um, full of sectarianism um, and then something that seems very sectarian can actually just be being honest as well. The first one they say is, we are different, we believe differently, you know, and the final one is you are evil or you are the devil. And what are the steps along the way? And it's easy to think, oh, yeah, you know, in my lifetime, I definitely just want to be based here, you know, and the thing of tolerating all differences. But some differences shouldn't be tolerated. So along the way, they have things to say, you know, because I disagree so seriously with what you think, I'm going to tell you what I think so that we can have an honest relationship with each other. That's a totally reasonable thing to say. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's filled with, with possibilities of, of violences that have been enacted in the name of that kind of language. But that doesn't mean that that kind of language shouldn't be used because we do have serious disagreements with each other. One of the other steps is to say, um, you are not who you say you are. We are who you say you are. That's a very serious thing. I'm a gay man and I've had people for years say to me, you're not a proper man. And from a, an, an analytical point of view, one of the things that they're doing is they're taking the possibility of empowered self-determination and self-communication from me and telling me that I fit into their category for me, not my category for me. Mm. And so that's happening all the time. And when you can begin to look um, at the ways we speak to each other through their lens, there can be some really, really helpful wisdoms and analyses that they offer. Um, Again, it's important to say it doesn't always transfer elsewhere, but there might be some things from it that you can go, oh, that bit is really helpful for me in applying this in another situation. Right. I'm interested, you've uh, already three or four times have said, I'm, I'm only speaking for the case in Ireland. Yeah. Um, wh why the care there? Because I've seen it so often. I mean, we've had people here, God Almighty, we've been plagued with people from overseas here who've arrived here to say, oh, yeah, you know, I've been in the Balkans, so I understand that. So therefore, I understand everything <laughs> here. And like, God Almighty, go home, leave us alone. Um, or people who think that the Irish situation can be understood through the lens of Israel and Palestine or through the lens mm. of the Balkans or further afield through Korea or South Africa. And there are similar dynamics um, sometimes, but then there's also always going to be particularities. I've heard some people imagine that because I've worked in conflict resolution here, that therefore I'd have solutions for um, dialogue about race in the United States. God almighty. I mean, the Irish um, witness in the United States has been one in of complicity with slavery and maintaining that. Who the hell would I think I am? That just because I've been working here in these dynamics mm. that I would have anything other than repentance and learning to do um, were I in the United States. So uh, questions of power manifest themselves very differently. And I always want to be really careful not to assume that because I've been long practiced in making mistakes here, that that necessarily gives me much wisdom for uh, application elsewhere. I suppose I yeah. always want things to be a, a proposal for a conversation rather than an imposition um, for the idea that I have any imagination about what something should look like in the United States or in other countries. From the American context, one of the things that we're certainly dealing with and have dealt with in various waves uh, since the founding of the United States is um, various forms of Christianity and nationalism. And obviously, Irish Catholicism is in some way a, a, a different species or, you know, of, of sort of Christianity and nationalism, I suppose. But what, what are some of your basic observations that you've had there about the ways in which Christianity gets co-opted, that rightful love for place gets co-opted? What, what are things you're learning and seeing and, and things you're having to grapple with and struggle with in that regard? Well, I, I suppose I want to trouble the word nationalism because I don't think mm. there is such a single thing as nationalism. I sometimes hear British people um, critique Irish nationalism and I find that both insulting and 
narrow-minded, as well as lack of information. Um, British nationalism, over the course of 700 years in Ireland, has sought to impose a version of nationalism from Britain in Ireland. Irish partial independence came about 100 years ago. And so I'm always curious as to what practice of colonisation and war making has the voice that has that is currently condemning nationalism had over the course of 400 years and how adequate are they in naming that <laughs> and dealing with yeah. that in their own historical lessons and their own pedagogy of historical education in school public commemorations so i see lots of small countries around the world who have been yearning for national independence for centuries suddenly begin to express something about nationalism um, and then you have these erstwhile colonial forces. And I do consider the United <laughs> States in a certain sense, white America to be ha to have had a American interests overseas imagination that has started wars in many places, as well as Britishness, as well as Frenchness, as well as Spanishness. They are the ones saying, oh, nationalism is a dangerous thing. And part of me wants to go, how the hell do you know? You've been going around making <laughs> wars for 500 years. Um, not America, obviously, they've come more lately to the war making machine. But I so therefore the question as to what do we mean by nationalism? Do we, when a small country just says, do you know what? We'd actually like a little bit of self determination. We'd like a constitution that we've written in our own language. That doesn't mean that we're going to be violent to people from other places that want to come in here. Not necessarily. It's usually the places that have been the most violent are the ones who are being the most critical of their erstwhile colonies that are seeking to find a self sense of self-determination and struggle into that articulation. So what we mean by nationalism is something that I think we, we probably need a, a variety of different words to refer to that. And I, I regularly hear people who live in countries that have had a strong public muscularity of in the war making machine of colonialism be very, very public about their opinion about small independent countries that are seeking to have our own languages mm. and seeking to have our own determinations. And I think most of the job of empire and former empire is to demonstrate how they know they have debts, not declarations, D-E-B-T-S, debts to pay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. because of the wars they've started and because of the languages yeah. they annihilated and because of the self-determination, because of the splitting up of communities, because of the famines that they orchestrated and then called natural and they weren't. Um, all of these things are, are the techniques and technologies of the last few hundred year, years of European expansion, A, into Europe and then B, further beyond Europe. And I hear lots of countries deny that they have that and think, oh, no, that's just the past. We're just talking about today. And I think that most people who have inherited a war affected past don't see that the past is so far away. We're speaking in English, for God's sake. I wish to God that my English were much poorer than it is. And I wish to God my Irish were as fluent as my English were. And that's an ongoing way within which the past is very present today. And then yeah. I look to the United States and I hear the amount of Murphys and McCarthy's and O'Toole's and O'Sullivan's Sul all around the place. And I think about how did the Irish who suffered a lot here nonetheless um, not learn the lessons of suffering and turn those into the creation of suffering for people in the trade of tears uh, in the uh, Irish support for the ongoing support for enslavement in the 1800s in the United States. Um, I wish to God that Irish people had been um, more critical of imperial powers when Irish people left here because of the famine. But unfortunately, typically Irish people joined up with those very forces in oppressing local populations in Jamaica, Montserrat, New Zealand, Australia, the United States and Canada. It's to our shame. I wrote my master's on a narrative analysis of human encounter in the Gospel of Mark, particularly between Jesus of Nazareth and marginalized um, people. And I was reading a, a, a commentary on Greek. <laughs> and, um, I, I, it was a great commentary and I looked, to the, I looked to the back of it to think, what other commentaries have this publishing house published in this series? Because it was so good. It was just magnificent. And there was you know, other biblical books written on the on the fly cover. They had commentary on the Gospel of Matthew, a commentary on 
First and Second Peter, there's a commentary on the Book of Revelation, there's a commentary on the facts of life, there's a commentary on the, um, the Acts of the Apostles. So nestled in there was this term, the facts of life, in the midst of all these biblical commentary books. And seeing that phrase, the facts of life, just there like that, shocked me. I didn't know what to make of it. And this poem is, I'd say, 90% written in the 10 minutes after seeing that. But I, I just couldn't get over, what are the facts of life? Um, and seeing it there made me qu query. Um, in conflict resolution, you're always thinking about what are the facts and what are the perceptions. And the difference between fact and perception is a major element that you're always going to be involved with. And it's not as simple as we think, um, because we argue about facts and perceptions all the time. And then we can think that perceptions are demoted and facts are the things that we want. And who decides what a fact is? Do you know. If somebody says, I haven't slept a wink since my husband was murdered 30 years ago, do you know, do you want to argue with that on a level of fact, <laughs> you know? Um, so here's a poem called The Facts of Life. That you were born and you will die. That you will sometimes love enough and sometimes not. That you will lie if only to yourself that you will get tired, that you will learn most from the situations you did not choose, that there will be some things that move you more than you can say, that you will live, that you must be loved, that you will avoid questions most urgently in need of your attention, that you began as the fusion of a sperm and an egg of two people who once were strangers and may well still be that life is fair, that life is sometimes good and sometimes even better than good, that life is often not so good, that life is real and if you can survive it, well, survive it well with love and art and meaning given where meaning scarce, that you will learn to live with regret that you will learn to live with respect, that the structures that constrict you may not be permanently constricting, that you will probably be okay, that you must accept change before you die, but you will die anyway, so you might as well live and you might as well love. You might as well love you might as well love. You are listening to Tokens, Public Theology, Human Flourishing, and the Good Life. We are most grateful to have you joining us. Please leave us one of those five-star reviews on Apple Podcasts and subscribe there or wherever you subscribe to podcasts. Remember, you can find our links, photos, books, and related videos from our extensive YouTube channel all at tokenshow.com slash podcast. This is our interview with poet, peacemaker, and theologian Piedreg Otuma from the Northern of Ireland. We actually have some lovely video footage of Piedreg doing several readings for us on our YouTube channel, available at youtube.com slash tokensshow or at tokenshow.com slash video. Part two in just a moment. You're listening to Tokens and our interview with Piedreg Otuma. In the, in the work that you're doing, in the, in the sort of encounters that you've described, is there a something that you believe can transcend difference? Is there a sort of intellectual construct, a theological construct, sociological construct, something beyond all that difference that somehow makes possible peaceableness or that makes possible... Uh, living together in, in some sort of constructive peace? Well, I appreciate the question, Lee. Um, and I, I don't think there is a something. Um, I, I think there's a practice and you move in and out of that practice. And sometimes it's too damn tiring to move into that practice. Um, I know that when it comes to my work in working with people who would propose that gay people are demon possessed or can be cured, for instance. I've got a lot of energy for engaging with that population of people who are public about that. But my partner, Paul, doesn't. 
And so sometimes mm. I'd have invited people who've said utterly hateful things in public to a meal in my house because part of me thinks, well, <laughs> I'll surprise you with hospitality. Not to make nice, but to have a serious argument over soup and mm -hmm. wine around my table. And Paul uh, agrees that that's a good thing to do, but he'll never be in the house when I have those meals. He'll always leave because mm. he's not interested. And so those are two very different manifestations of hopefully two moral responses. Um, his response is moral. My, my serious doubt is to whether mine is. <laughs> um, uh, and so I, I suppose it's all in the practice. There is no intellectual assent. There is no theory. And so I don't think that there's any one imagination as to what that looks like. The Pedagogy of Conflict is a poem that I wrote following a, um, uh, a, a week-long encounter with folks from all across Ireland of a whole variety of political and religious points of view, um, as well as folks from Israel and Palestine from a whole variety of political and religious points of view. And our aim wasn't to come to agreement in the room, but our aim was to practice in the room something that might be beneficial for continuing to be in conversation with each other, to learn from each other and to educate each other in terms of um, the pasts that we didn't hear the other comprehend. Um, and I, During that week, I heard so many people refer to their earliest memories where conflict was normalised. And I was thinking about the impact of growing up in, in conflict or war impacted societies where your family have to educate you to say, here's what you need to know when you're five or, or less or more. And in the room at one point, somebody said that they'd murdered someone and they'd served a sentence for that. And somebody else said, don't use the word murder because they were part of the same political point of view. They said, lives were lost in the context of conflict. Don't use the word murder. That person said, I'll use whatever word I want. And somebody else said, oh, I killed somebody and another person disagreed with that. And somebody else said, I only ever shot at legitimate targets. And then somebody else said, well, I suppose that made me a legitimate target then when your organization shot at me when I was a child. And so I found myself thinking about grammar and numbers and words as a result of that. And there's a there's a poem, a longer poem called The Pedagogy of Conflict. And I'll read the third part of it here. When I was a child, I learned to count to five. One, two, three, four, five. But these days I've been counting lives. So I count one life, one life, one life, one life, one life. Because each time is the first time that that life has been taken. Legitimate target has 16 letters and one long, abominable space between two dehumanizing words. I hear lots of resonance with a number of your poems in which uh, like, like, for example, um, readings from the Book of Exile, where you have this, these recurring numbers on uh, narrative theology. Oh, yeah. Um, and your emphasis upon story, taking up a story in which the, the end of the story is not yet known. Yeah. Um, is, 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 is that sort of a resonant? Am I hearing that correctly, you think, of, of your, you're saying there's the practice, there's not necessarily a, a single construct or a single thing, and, and your, your own sort of affinity for narrative theology? Yeah, well, I, I think narrative theology, I, I, I'm on my third degree in theology at the moment. I find it fascinating. Um, <laughs> I mean, partly the longer I study theology, the more questions I have about the idea of God. Right. Um, but the more curiosity I have about the great um, storytelling arc that we find within Hebrew Bible and the Christian scriptures, as well as other scriptures. Um, I am interested in how a narrative approach to theology isn't new, but has been around for a very long time. I'm interested in the courage 
of the Jews to have an entire body of work and practice of work in the Midrash that just asks very serious questions of the text and believes that the text, if it's serious, needs to have serious questions asked of it. And if the text can't cope with that, or if the God can't cope with that, well, then it's not a sufficient text or God that you have in your imagination. Mm. <laughs> and I think that that is a magnificent way to go about um, asking yeah. questions about religion. And if religion is important, it cannot be communicated um, in a simple list of here's what you do and then don't question. That's not religion. I mean, that's control. Even if it's wise, even if the instructions are wise to demand action with and deny the capacity for curiosity or questioning or pushing, I think is to deny the project of being human. And I, I'm always interested in the multiple approaches to anything. So whether that's something a politician says or a priest says, both of them, if they want their words to be taken seriously, should be open to being asked serious questions. And when I hear defensiveness of anybody in those public roles like politicians or priests, I just think if if you can't cope with a serious question, perhaps you shouldn't be in your job. I think I think for the last bit of conversation here, I, I would like to turn to one last um, question about peace with oneself. I noted especially in readings from the Book of Exile, for example, um, "Tis the gift." You start, "Tis the gift to be gentle with yourself." At the end of a day when you've given, of a day when you're spent. I've received that as a sort of uh, sweet invitation to be hmm. gentle with oneself and to be peaceable with oneself. H how does that work with you, and, and what are your own habits and practices hmm. of coming to be at peace with oneself? Hmm. And partly that, that poem is a somewhat presumptuous continuation of the well-known Shaker hymn, Tis the gift to be simple, tis right. the gift to be free. So it can be sung to that tune if you're a singing mm. person. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a brewing company in Belfast have taken that poem and put it on the side of one of their stouts, which is a great joy. <laughs> I think it might be one of my favorite publications. <laughs> that would ever. be a great joy to me as well. Yeah. yeah, to be on the side of a bottle of stout. I suppose I have never seen a situation in conflict zones and in conflict dialogue where accusing somebody in a way that is built on the imagination of their total demise has ever worked. <laughs> so if I mm. want you to believe something, accusing you and insulting you, where I, where I only think that I just want to see your ridicule in public, I have never seen that work, even when it's justified. <laughs> and <laughs> it often is because we believe terrible things about each other and have done terrible things to each other. Yeah. And I've been in rooms with people where one person would say, I'm a member of this organization. And another person would say, well, that organization shot my father and then denied that they shot him or, den or, say, or called him a legitimate target. So um, those are terrible rooms to be in. Um, we need to say difficult things to each other. But partly I've, where I've seen that kind of dialogue work has been where somebody can speak very truthfully and very bluntly, but with an invitation to say, we can do this better with each other. We don't have to be friends, but I, I don't want you to have to face the kind of thing that you made us face. I want you to face what you did, and then we can participate in something civic together. So I've seen that work, and I've seen it powerfully. Um, it's painful. And I suppose I'm interested in, how can I start that with myself? <laughs> how mm. can I have a spiritual practice that can be blunt in naming wrongdoing? of myself, but also have an imagination of the self that is an invitation to a better way of being human, a more moral way of being human. And, and that interests me. And I suppose I'm interested in an inner practice that locates me in the here and now and locates me also in the in the face of my pains and my privileges and asks me to do something interesting in the practice of those things as a as a, a person alive today. Um, so I suppose for me, a spiritual practice is to just greet everything, to say hello to it, you know, to look at every day as the possibility of seeing things that I've anticipated and things I haven't anticipated. Um, Ignatius of Loyola is an old friend of mine, the founder of the Jesuits, <laughs> dead a long time, but I think about him every day. And he um, 
I think has helped me a huge amount to be present to, to life as it is, hopefully more mm. and more of life as it is. And I think by starting off the day by thinking, well, here's what I know is going to happen today. You know, there'll be an interview with Lee at some point later on today or and there'll be a phone call after that and then there'll be some poems. And to think about the things that I'm thinking, oh, those will be lovely. To think about the things that I think, oh, that'll be the highlight of my day. And then to think about the thing that I'm already imagining, oh, that's going to be terrible. And to find just a little bit of distance from my imagination of all those things. And to think, well, how do I want to be in the presence of all those things? Whether what I'm anticipating to be beautiful is beautiful or not, whether what I'm anticipating to be terrible is terrible or not, that there might be a small practice of hospitality in that that can help me be more present to being more honest and more truthful to myself and to other people in those moments. Um, to pay attention to the little things that annoy me, the little arguments I have in my head, a repetition of an argument or a fantasy argument with somebody. How can I pay attention to those and to go, what's happening? Why am I inventing an argument that's not even happening or <laughs> continuing an argument that's been going on for 15 years in my head? Why am I doing that? Who are these characters that I'm dragging up like an archetype in order to create um, some kind of visual um, manifestation of something else that's happening inside of me? How can I pay yeah. attention to those things? Not by shouting at myself or saying that I'm a total failure as a human being, but by asking myself to take something seriously, take something playfully, and to, to, to consider that to be the meat of spirituality. Yeah. Immediately following that um, is what has to be the greatest title of a, of a poem I've ever read, uh, entitled... Of skinny dipping, lonely nights, charcoal fires, absolution, loads of guilt, breakfast, bucketfuls of projection, and forgiveness, and then parenthetically a longish reflection on the last chapter of the fourth gospel. <laughs> so a brilliant, a brilliant title. I'm glad you um, like that one. I read that chapter every year on my birthday. It's been a very important really? chapter for me. Yeah. And every year I, I find something different in it, some corner of it that the year has brought or the day is bringing um, in conversation with that chapter. I've done it since I was mm. 18. And mm. um, it's been a lovely ritual every year on my birthday to do it. Yeah, yeah. I, I think one of the reasons I love uh, love this particular poem of yours so much is that um, I, you know, I, I was raised in a very rationalistic Christian tradition. And so we... We did not take lightly to claims of mystical experience or charismatic experience or anything like that. And um, and so not necessarily being open to that, uh, I, I can't say that I've had too many sorts of mystical experiences, but, but one of the few that I have had was a kind of meditation upon that chapter. Oh, what happened? And the... the the threefold, the threefold repeated. Do you love yeah, me? Yeah. Um, I was actually, I was actually in a in a uh, garden in um, London, and I had taken students over, and um, and so we had been doing some reading that week about the hist historical uh, poverty in the East End of London, and so we had done a we had done an outing the day before, and and trying to grapple with some of those questions and. Um, and then we would leave from there to go see our friends in Nairobi, where my wife and I spent uh, a chunk of time in our early married years working at a slum in Nairobi. And so here we were, having read about historical poverty and the struggles uh, in that context, and then getting ready to go see our friends in Nairobi. And I was in this beautiful context. And the sorts of self-loathing and the guilt that may come with that kind of sense of privilege and so I was praying and, and asking, you know, is this is this career, this vocation, God, what you want of me? And um, and three and threefold during that time, I heard, "Do you love me?" And uh, it was a very significant moment for mm -hmm. for my life. And so I, I I think your your depiction here is uh, is very beautiful. Mm. That's that's so moving. I mean, what I hear in that is that one of the things you were doing in your reflection was that you were making a decision in conversation with a text that you knew and loved. Um, mm. And I think that that's one of the powerful things about story is that, you know, whether you're turning to uh, Lord of the Rings or the Bible, that with texts that we know and love that present moral conundra and present serious decision making turning points of our lives and serious admissions of wrongdoing in our lives, that those characters, whether they're fictional or not, 
can be profound companions to us as we make mm-hmm. and look for courage to act in the moment and look for a way to set priorities to, you know, to, rather than am I doing the right thing with my career or not? You heard the question of, are you loving? <laughs> mm. Amazing um, reframing of a question, which is basically saying, do whatever the hell you want, provided you're loving. Let me let me do ask this one more question. You you mentioned Igno- Ignatius of Loyola being an old friend of yours, um, and I, I like that construct because I, th- I oftentimes find myself thinking that way. Um, and I'll also think in terms of in the, the Christian doctrine of resurrection. I will I will tell myself about the people I look forward to being friends with in the resurrection. And so I, I have my list of people that uh, you know. So, so there's there's Thomas Merton or there's uh, Dag Hammarskjöld and so forth. Dorothy Day, if she'll have anything to do with me. Um, but who who are other friends of yours in that regard that uh, that you enjoy friendship with? <laughs> That's a lovely question. Um, I, Wangari Matai is uh, <laughs> comes to my mind so regularly. Um, she was the first um, East African woman to get a PhD. Um, she got the Nobel Peace Prize for her Green Belt movement. She only died a few years ago. Um, mm. She had gone back to her to the place that she'd grown up and seen that the stream she'd played in was now barely a trickle. And mm. um, so much of that was as a result of the Catholic missionaries having plenty of whom were Irish, I'm sure, um, having come to her part of Kenya and um, ripped up the fig tree because the fig tree was seen to be a kind of a, a religious symbol for the the local religion, Kikuyu religion, I think it was. Mm. And um but the fig tree had deep roots, and so by killing these trees that were indigenous to the area, um, a lot of erosion happened, and so a lot of water shortage happened, and a lot of conflict arose as a result of this water shortage. So she started the Green Belt Movement. And I'm, I might get the numbers wrong, but from what I remember, she said she planted seven trees as a kind of a restorative process to this erosion, and five died. And so she planted 52 million, <laughs> and she won the oh Nobel Peace Prize. I don't know, 12 or 15 years ago or so. She's died since. So um, anytime I look at trees and anytime I think of the relationship between place and conflict and place and the peoples who are living in that place, I turn to her um, uh, for her analysis as well as her joy. She had a great singing voice. I've in mm. Krista Tippett interviewed her years ago, which is how I came across it. Or came across her work and came across, you know, uh, her practice. And she finishes the interview with singing a song. She says, can I sing? <laughs> so she does. <laughs> it's beautiful. I, I just think that there is such a synthesis of humor, of gratitude, of love for her grandmother's religion, as well as for the Catholicism that she grew up with, love for science, love for analysis, love for priorities, love for music. Um, so she's certainly one. Um, Ignatius, absolutely. Um, perhaps highest among all is is Judas. I think Judas mm. is uh, an extraordinary character, and he is a friend that I turn to as I think of my um, how how wrong my desires can be, um, mm. and how I can get in the way of myself, and then also how terrible people can be in the name of treating somebody who's done wrong. I think Judas knows a lot about that. I think of Ruth and Orpa and Naomi. I think those, hmm. a trinity of women, know a lot about each other and know a lot about the human condition and about um, borders and law. And I live in a place where borders and law <laughs> are on my mind all the time. <laughs> so I've spent a lot of time um, in conversation with them. Um, I mean, there's, if I start naming the poets who I consider to be friends, some of them are living, but I'd never be in touch with them, as well as all the dead poets. Um, I'd be here a long time. Emily Dickinson is one. Mm. Um, I, I love Emily Dickinson's work because it's so strange. It's, it's like some other being wrote it. And I love her letters because they're so full of warmth and humour and birds and flowers and um, compassion. Her letters of condolence to anybody who's recently been bereaved are a thing of great mm. beauty. This poem was written, shaking hands, for a time when um, the British Queen, Queen Elizabeth II, and um, Martin McGuinness, who was the Deputy First Minister in Northern Ireland, 
um, met and shook hands. Um, each of them considered each other an enemy. There's reasons why, um, and they hadn't shaken hands in public before. And I was invited to this event, and I was thinking a lot about shaking hands, and I suppose I wanted to think about what the impact of shaking hands could be and what it could look like. Um, and it, it's, it's humble possibilities as well as it's huge possibilities altogether. It's much longer than what I'll read. I'll only read a selection. Shaking hands. Because what's the alternative? Because of courage. Because of loved ones lost. Because it's a small thing, shaking hands. It happens every day. Because I heard of one man whose hands haven't stopped shaking since a market day in Oma. Because it takes a second to say hate, but it takes longer, much longer, to be a great leader. Much, much longer. Because shared space without human touching doesn't amount to much. Because it's tough because it's meant to be tough. And this is the stuff of memory, the stuff of hope, the stuff of gesture and meaning and leading because it has taken so, so long, because it has taken land and money and languages and barrels and barrels of blood. Because lives have been lost, because lives have been taken, because to be bereaved is to be troubled by grief, because more than two troubled peoples live here. Because I know a woman whose hand hasn't been shaken since she was a man. Because shaking a hand is only a part of the start. Because I know a woman whose touch calmed a man whose heart was breaking. Because privilege is not to be taken lightly. Because this just might be good. Because who said that this would be easy? Because some people love what you stand for, and for some, if you can, they can. Because solidarity means a common hand. Because a hand is only a hand. So hang on to it. So join your much discussed hands. We need this for one small second. So touch, so lead. Well, uh, it's been a it's been a privilege uh, oh, visiting with you, Padre. Thank you. My pleasure. And uh, grateful for your work, and uh, grateful for your your witness in the world, oh. and the beauty of your words, and the beauty of your work. We thank you. Thanks very much. You've been listening to Tokens Public Theology, Human Flourishing, The Good Life. Thanks so much for joining us, and please remember to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, and please remember to refer us to a fellow podcast listener. Feedback, well, we do love hearing from you. Email us text or attach a voice memo and send to the address podcast at tokensshow.com. Our thanks to all the stellar team that make this podcast possible. Executive producer and manager Christy Bragg of Bragg Management. Co-producer Jacob Lewis of Great Feeling Studios. Associate producer Leslie Thompson of Rogue Creative Marketing and Media. Associate producer Ashley Bain. Engineer Carrie Ed Harmon. Production assistant Kara Fox. Music beds by Zach and Maggie White. And our live event production team at Stonebrook Media, led by Phil Barnett. Special thanks to creative filmmaker Sam Kwan, who facilitated our interview with Pydrig in Ireland. You can learn more about Sam at thesamquan.com. The live performance on this episode was from a so-called Class and Grass segment, performed by the most outstanding Horeb Mountain Boys, with Aubrey Haney, Buddy Green, Pete Utlinger, Chris Brown, Byron House, and Jeff Taylor, along with the Annie Moses Band, with vocals by Annie Wallover. Thanks for listening, and peace be unto thee. The Tokens Podcast is a production of Tokens Media, LLC, and Great Feeling Studio. Oh.